So today um, we're going to be talking about intellectual property, which is a right to be the monopolistic producer of a good for some period of time. Uh, intellectual property takes several different forms. Copyrights, uh, which are usually given to uh, authors and other creators of artistic productions. Patents, which are given to inventors. Trade secrets, which is, is information uh, which is held private from uh, the rest of society and used to maintain a monopoly position, such as like a secret formula for a soda. And uh, also another form of intellectual property is what we call authenticity rents, which are um, the fact that you know an artist, even if it's possible for other people to completely replicate whatever they've produced, might still be able to sell the original for quite a lot of money because people sort of want to have the original. That social norm can function in a very similar way to what intellectual property does. So intellectual property is one of the oldest tools of economic policy. Um, it dates at least back to the 7th century BC Greece. And today we're going to try to learn about um, some of the trade-offs involved in intellectual property as well as its relationship to the theory of optimal punishment of crime. So I'll start by talking about uh, what sorts of things monopoly profits provide an incentive for. Um, and oh, I should also mention office hours again are 3 to 5 today rather than the normal time tomorrow. So I'll talk about what monopoly profits incentivize, uh, what, they, what they create an incentive for. Uh, and then I'll relate that to Schumpeter's analysis of creative destruction in, in markets. I'll then talk about the crime from a static and a dynamic perspective. And from that we'll derive the optimal degree of enforcement of the laws. And then I'll relate that analysis to um, the optimal degree of intellectual property, trading off the incentives that are provided for innovation against the ex post uh, monopoly distortion. And we'll talk about, uh, we'll, we'll do that through a model of optimal intellectual property, take some lessons for policy, and then discuss intellectual property a bit more broadly. So, so far in the course, we basically said that the monopoly has two effects. One effect is a distortion, which is the dead weight loss that it creates, right? The other is just a transfer from the consumers to the monopolists. Um, and so, to some extent, we viewed this transfer as sort of irrelevant or benign, you know, not important. And in this lecture, we're going to focus on this as actually the primary issue. Um, now, redistribution is one reason we might not want to give the monopoly more money. You might think that those people tend to be wealthier than the poor, so that relates to what we talked about a week ago. But um, <coughs> the key offset to that is that what encourages firms to create new uh, innovations and products in the first place is the pursuit of the monopoly profits that creating those profits can offer them. And, um, and so the uh, as long as there's a significant response of who creates new products to those rewards, then it's going to be really important to think about uh, trying to provide those rewards to incentivize the creation of new products. And um, what, whether those profits will incentivize good things or bad things depends on the context. So some activities that are used to obtain monopoly are sort of pure waste or rent seeking, in which case we can think of the monopoly profits as being maybe not completely, but to a large extent, just waste. Because even though you can think of them as a transfer, people are going to try to lobby in order to obtain that transfer, right? And that's going to lead that transfer to be what economists call dissipated into the wasteful lobbying activity. <coughs> Um, and so in this case, monopoly is much, much more harmful than in the standard analysis, right? Because not just the dead weight loss triangle, but also the whole area of monopoly profits counts as social waste. On the other hand, the monopoly profits could be an incentive to create a new market, like to create, you might, in order to gain the profits on making, you know, iPhones, 
create the iPhone. The iPhone bring, brought huge amounts of benefits to society, much beyond those that were captured by Apple as the profits, right? Because there was a whole big area of consumer surplus. And because the monopolist can never capture that, creating a <laughs> new market always has a positive, what's called entrepreneurial externality. Yeah, go ahead. What would be an example for the one that's pure waste? So imagine like uh, the taxi drivers lobbying to have like other people prevented from entering the taxi industry. I've just been reading about the New Deal, and there's a huge amount spent on like farmers trying to get the industry monopolized. Um, uh, there's, there's lots of examples like that where the government's not really incentivizing anything. It's just like helping people form a monopoly. And the problem with that is not just the distortion that it causes, but the fact that people have a big incentive to lobby to try to obtain those privileges, and that's wasteful as well. On the other hand, if they're creating a new product that's valuable to the market, this creates what's called an entrepreneurial externality. They don't capture the consumer <coughs> surplus, they only capture the profits. And this makes monopoly far better than the standard analysis. In fact, it may very well be worth tolerating that dead weight loss in order to encourage the creation of new products. Um, and uh, this uh, consideration, what happens to that dead weight loss triangle, can be much more important than the static distortions associated with monopoly, because often the dead weight loss triangle is small compared to the monopoly uh, profits. So um, this is particularly true when uh, market when other firms in a market have market power. So if you're literally just a monopolist yourself, the ratio of dead weight loss to monopoly profits is you know, determined by some, some pass-through thing that we discussed earlier in class. But imagine that you're competing with uh, some other firms, right? So that when you expand your production, that takes away some production from other firms, as, as uh, we had a, on problem one on the exam. <coughs> then the dead weight loss can actually be very small from people having market power. Because basically, if they were to expand their production to reduce their price, they would take away from other people their profits. And so there's not actually that much dead weight loss associated with having that reduced production, but there could be quite a lot of profits associated with it. So this, this is an example. Imagine that rather than having this monopoly uh, profit here, if we were to have prices that were quite a bit closer to competition, like here, then the profits could still be quite significant, right? That area would be profits, but the dead weight loss triangle would be very small, right? And so if there's uh, some degree of competition, dead weight loss may be much, much smaller than is the profits. And that's exactly what Harberger's analysis showed, right? Was that even though monopoly may lead to significant profits, the dead weight loss that it causes is very small, and therefore it may be much more important for us to figure out what are the incentives created by the monopoly's profits, rather than figuring out what are the distortions to the production cars. Um, and so, past Thursday, we talked briefly about ways of getting monopoly, of gaining monopoly power, but let's go back over those and think about what types of incentives those give in terms of the activities they encourage. So protection from the government based on lobbying, as I was discussing with Victor, like licensure, chartered corporations, uh, you know, things during the Great Depression where they created cartels and in industries, um, can be uh, can be very harmful because they create big incentives for people to lobby to try to obtain those special privileges. Um, sometimes it can actually make some sense for the government to give these charters. So from a dead, pure dead weight loss perspective, so for example, if a comp, you know, the UK uh, during the 18th century had a bunch of monopolistic export companies that were had sole right to export out of the country. And that actually made sense because the UK didn't want people to be a monopolist over their own people because that would harm you know, the people of England. But if, the, if they're trying to be a monopolist over foreigners, that's great for them, right? So they'd love to raise prices on the foreigners. So sometimes that can make sense, but the problem is once you start establishing a precedent like that, even if for that reason it makes sense, it can encourage people to do a lot to try to obtain those privileges, and that can end up wasting a lot of the value that can be obtained by those higher prices. Um, a second 
uh, it, it way that you can obtain a monopoly is by private or illegal violence. So monop mafia control of illegal industries, casinos, and so forth, because there are no antitrust laws for industries that are illegal, uh, it's very easy to form monopolies there. Um, in some cases, exclusionary practices by existing companies uh, can have similar effects. And um, these uh, sort of, okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the incentive effects of these in a moment. But so then forming an illegal cartel in a legal industry is illegal uh, under antitrust laws, but it wasn't always that way. So in Europe, prior to the um, prior to the birth of the European Union, it was basically legal for companies to write cartel agreements, and those cartel agreements could even be enforced by courts. Um, and this, and even though it's illegal, there's still quite a few uh, cases brought every year for illegal cartels. One very famous one was about vitamins a few years ago, um, and some of these are international as well. Another way that a monopoly can be formed is by a merger of existing companies, and the way that the government uh, tries to prevent this from happening is. Um, is that they review all uh, mergers by firms. We'll talk about this more in a couple of weeks. Um, but in some countries, there's no prohibition against merging. So in Peru, um, what basically happened when Peru opened up to free trade was that people thought, oh, now there's going to be lots of competitors that are going to come in. This is going to make the industry much more competitive. But what actually happened is that SAB Miller uh, realized that they had enough money to buy up all the Brazilian beer producers. And so they used free trade to buy up all of the beer producers, and now 96% of the beer market in Peru is controlled by one company. Um, yeah, David. Wouldn't the Peruvian government be concerned about uh, prices for consumers? And yeah, like they should be. They should be, I agree. That's why I was lobbying the Peruvian government <coughs> and giving speeches this summer telling them that they should do that, but they haven't yet. <coughs> There's basically a political dynamic in Peru where any form of government intervention is viewed as being like communist. <coughs> Not that we ever have anyone like that in the United States. Um, and, and so everyone would accuse people who were trying to do that of being like Chavistas or something like that. Um, and a final way is, is intellectual property, which we'll focus on today. So beyond the static distortion uh, caused by these, you know, what does each of these ways of monopoly encourage people to do in order to obtain them? So one is, you know, to lobby the government. And I think we think this is pretty darn wasteful as a way to, uh, as an activity. We don't think it adds very much to social value. Um, but if lobbying requires that the company be popular with the public and not just be paying the legislators for, like, you know, spending money on stupid campaigns, then they might, um, in order to uh, maintain or uh, create their monopoly, try to bring benefits to some part of the country or to the district of a particular political leader, give money to charity, AT&T in order to maintain its monopoly, for a long time spent a huge amount on research uh, that was you know, good not just for AT&T but for the rest of society. So depending on how those benefits can be channeled for genuinely beneficial activities rather than just corrupting politicians, they may not be so, so terrible. Um, on the other hand, private and illegal violence, I think, is almost always uh, a bad incentive created by monopoly power in illegal markets. Uh, basically, the, most of the violence that's going on in Mexico is people fighting over the right to be the distributor of cocaine to the United States. Um, an illegal cartel um, may encourage some waste on trying to enforce the cartel illegally because it may be costly to do that to some extent. But mostly I think it's quite similar to a merger in terms of the incentive effects it has because basically it's just a way of merging outside of the law. How about a merger? Well, um, the 